there was so much that I felt like I had left out of the last three Arrow videos that I wanted to kind of do a, uh, just kind of a, a, a free form thought flowing video where I literally just talk about a few things and, uh, and try to again, add to the Arrow conversation. And I'm going to talk about my actual setup that I've been using and the setup that I, that I plan to use this year. And if I'm going to change anything for different, uh, you know, for different game. So I've got a, uh, <clears throat> as far as cigars go, this is a, uh, it's European. It's kind of interesting. Swiss, it's Swiss. Swiss her sweet. <laughs> oh. That's a bad, that's a bad joke. It's not even, a, I'm not even a dad. And that's a very dad joke. Uh, I was out of cigars, so I'm going to smoke one of these, and I'm not that excited about it, but we're off and running. The good news is, drink some, uh, some Blantons with it. The bad news is, I forgot a glass up at the house, so it's a good thing that this is me by myself. And if you're curious, this is the N. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Let's start at the knock. So... I've shot pr probably just like everybody else who shot for a while. A, I think a lighted knock is super important and for a couple of reasons. When tr trying to film, for, for example, number one, and then number two, if you actually make contact with the animal and you have a lighted knock, you literally see that knock go into the animal and then disappear and it gives you a way better idea of where you actually hit the animal on the front end. Once you get out of your blind or out of your stand, or you, you, you know, if you've been spotting stalking, once you make your way up to the arrow, you're actually going to be able to find it because the knock is lit up. Makes sense. That's what they designed them for. The knock system that I went with this year for my elk hunt and ones that I'm going to be using for whitetail this season are the fire knocks. They're expensive like compared to regular knocks, I think they're like 70 bucks for three of them compared to, you know, something like nocturnals, which are probably about half that price. But the way they're configured, basically the majority of uh, all of the sensitive parts are actually tucked down into the shaft of the arrow. So you start by putting this little, um, this little stopper down in there and you you use glue to kind of adhese this you know one or two grain little stopper down in there then there's the battery and a little circuit board and then the led light that are you know kind of obviously a cylinder because they have to fit into an arrow makes sense those drop down into the shaft and then you have a really small knock and the advantage of a really small knock is it's not going to get ripped out as it's flying through an animal or hitting debris or hitting a tree. It doesn't stick out past the width of the shaft, which is what so many of the other lighted knocks do. As far as brightness goes, it's super bright. Like I can see them flying in broad daylight, no problem. Like they'll actually, if you have a morning shot on a deer and you actually hit, the lighted knock is worth having even in the, in, in, Maybe not noon sun, but like 9 a.m., absolutely, you're going to see it. The issue that I have with some of the other lighted knocks are even still consistent with the fire knocks. I've got uh, I've got four left, basically. I bought six. I blew two up because I Robin Hooded a couple of arrows, uh, being a moron, and which they actually still worked. So both of them. Um, I, I, I blew one of the knocks in half 
and the LED was still on. And then the other one, I had like a full on basically Robin Hood. It split the shaft on the arrow up a ways and the LED was still working. On the other hand, I've got two now that aren't working anymore. I don't know if it's battery or if it's something got kind of jostled. I, I'm not sure. If you're going to use the Fire Knock system, make 100% sure that you read the directions because it's kind of a multi-step process. And if you get that stopper wrong, like if you, if you, if you push it in a little too far or you don't push it in far enough, which honestly the not pushing it in far enough is a worse problem to have because when you stack everything on top of each other, the battery, the circuit board, the knock won't actually seat all the way down. It's bad news. Um, I'm not great at following directions, so, oh good, good. This is the problem with the Swishers is they actually expect you to uh, smoke them. You can't just sit here and have a conversation with yourself, which is what I'm doing. That's when you know you got a good cigar when it lights on fire. You know what? I'm going to quit complaining. I'm going to enjoy myself because it's freaking October. Fall is here. This is one more fall in my life that I get to experience. I don't know, man. I'm just jacked about this hunting season. I am excited about it. All right. Moving back to, to the conversation about knocks that I'm having with myself and you. I think if you use one of the other brands, you have to make really sure that that knock is going to stay in the arrow. And maybe use some hot melt or maybe use something that, that, that's going to give it a little bit more hold inside of the actual shaft of the arrow. I've got some nocturnals that I've, I've messed with. The, it, they're the ones that come with the multiple different like sleeves to increase the diameter or decrease the diameter based on your arrow. And uh, they're pretty loosey-goosey. Pretty loosey goosey. I used them for Aero Video Three. You saw them on the uh, the 150 spine rampage that was like a 845 grains, I think. And if that went through an animal, that was gonna get ripped out for sure. Because I could literally just walk up with my hands and just kind of go, boop, just pull it out. And I had the right side of the sleeve, the whole deal. So just if you're gonna use nocturnals, keep that in mind. I'm glad that we spent the first five minutes of this video talking about knocks. It's kind of ridiculous. Knocks are important, though. They they genuinely are something that I think people overlook, and it is this your it is the start of the continuum of force that you have introduced to an arrow. Your bow goes off. The first thing that gets pushed is that knock. So having good knocks is important. If you're going to use the victory arrows, do not buy the victory lighted knocks. They are junk. Maybe they've changed them. I I think I bought six last year. And they either quickly stopped working, they're not very bright, but the bigger deal is that the, stru the structural integrity on them was super low. Uh, I broke one on a shot. It just folded right at the shaft, basically. There's like a, there's kind of a throat that's on the knock where you, where you slide to turn it off. And that just broke. And I literally broke a string on my traverse last year because of that knock. So maybe I'm being a little too hard on them, but I don't think it's worth the money. Um, here we go. Let's see if this works this time. Let's move up. I use an arrow wrap because I'm always messing around with the fletchings. Like I'm always just kind of doing something. And the arrow wrap allows me to peel the fletchings off and not damage the carbon shaft. You, you can do it on the carbon shaft and it's not... It's not the end of the world, but it's really easy to get them off if you're actually using a wrap. I know a lot of guys are worried about the weight because you are, uh, every grain that you add to the back of the arrow steals a lot more FOC than adding weight to the front. Like I think it's something like a seven to one ratio is what I remember. You have to add seven grains up front for every one grain that you add in the back to, to increase your FOC. I could be totally wrong on that that is literally just off the top of my head you should probably go research that if you're interested in in foc 
the arrow configuration that I was running for elk um, was sixteen was six hundred and fifteen total grains. I was running a four fletched AAE max stealth vein on the back, and what I noticed as I was doing vein tests because I, I I've done this the last few years I'll I'll fletch a bunch of different stuff up. Something like the uh, Max Hunters, the AAE Max Hunters, they steer the crap out of a broadhead. Like, they will do a great job. I feel like you could put, like, a, a sideways Frisbee on the front of that thing, and those AAE Max Hunters would be great to steer. But they're loud. And then the same with Blazers. So what I don't want is I don't want an arrow that's that's going through the air that's that's loud, noisy. I don't want an animal to hear the snap of the bow and then to perceive that something is getting closer. I think that they react to that more because common sense. So the AAE Max Stealth veins are as quiet as I've found. Uh, and, and yet they were still big enough to actually steer a fixed blade broadhead that was on the front of the arrow. What I found strange was I tried like a two degree offset and I didn't go up incrementally. I just did like two degree offset, three fletched, two degree offset, four fletched. And then I, and then I did some that were, um, five degree helical, three fletched, and then five degree helical, uh, four fletched. And when I got past 50 yards and, and keep in mind, I'm extremely comfortable with how well my bow, my bow is tuned. I was bear shafting those day six shafts at 50 yards in the size of a softball with, with a regular group of, of target tipped arrows. Like that sucker was dialed in from 50 to a hundred yards with a, uh, with a, a solid fixed blade head on the front, the hard helical grouped better. And it wasn't like it grouped a little bit better. It grouped a lot better. So I was a little surprised and I was worried, what I was worried about was the, I was basically worried that the, that the, the speed of the arrow was going to overdrive the uh, rotation. So if the arrow is going too fast and you've got too much helical on there, what's going to happen is that that thing is going to start to parachute out because, well, there's a number of reasons that it would do that, but I, I took uh, I took plenty of video of myself. I went all the way back to 120 yards for the for the test for the broadheads, and if the bow was a little out of tune, like I'd, I'd mess with something, I'd use a larger diameter arrow, like that Rampage 150 spine, and then I'd forget and I'd go back to the day six and I'd shoot it. It would be good for 30 yards, and then you would see it tar start to spin. It was like it just couldn't it just couldn't it couldn't recover with the bow that was out of tune, but when it was all dialed in, zero parachuting, zero parachuting. It was just a laser beam that went straight from the bow into the target. So that's what I ended up with uh, this year. I, I also wonder if the veins were configured the way they were and had that hard helical because the, the shaft is pretty narrow. And then you've got this head that's wider on the front end, like even the sleeve and collar increases in, in diameter, and then you've got the actual broadhead. And what I wondered was, is air, um, kind of like when you're drafting behind a, uh, a semi truck, like all you'll pull up close to a semi truck and all of a sudden it's, and then you get behind it in a certain place when you're way too close to one. I used to do this on the motorcycle all the time and you get right behind the thing. And all of a sudden it just feels like the air disappeared. What I'm wondering is was the air being thrown over uh, the shaft and it was only catching on the top, whatever, half of the actual veins or fletching. This is 100% speculation. I'm just speculating. I have no idea if that's the case or not. Cigars out again. So I'm going to stop uh, smoking this because not only is it hard to keep it lit, but it's not very good either. Oh, if you're wondering, this is the microphone up here. If you see like a random blue light that's uh, that's emanating from my temple. That is good. I, 
I tested uh, numerous kind of name brand veins. Uh, I didn't do any of the tack veins, and I would like to try some of those. I didn't try the, AA, uh, the AAE hybrid, which I see uh, quite a few guys running this year. I want to do a vein video, so I'll probably do that at a certain point. And what I want to do is a repeat of a video that I did kind of right from the start when I, when I started the channel. That was, I took a bow and I put it out of tune. And then I wanted to see what veins worked the best when you actually were shooting a fixed blade broadhead out of tune, except I wasn't good at making videos at the time. Not that I'm like great now, but I just forgot to put the premise in the video. So I just looked like a moron just out there shooting and being like, these veins suck because they don't steer broadhead good. Um, so I'm going to repeat that video, but with the actual uh, accurate premise put in it. Let's get back on focus here. Let's we'll be done with veins for right now. Um, I think that you know what I say that. I think if you are shooting a uh, a slower bow, maybe the super hard helical isn't uh, isn't a great idea. But I think it's worth testing out. Like going and getting some of the uh, some of the fletching tools are. It's not like a crazy huge investment. So I, I think it could be. I think it could be worth it. All right, moving up into the shaft. I, uh, I shot the day six 300 spine and it's a, it's a micro diameter arrow. The concern with micros is always the, um, is always the brittleness of the arrow. They, they, they seem to have a harder time holding up and I have not found that to be the case with, with this run of day six arrows that I've gotten. I'm not, I'm not saying that, uh, they've never had any issues or that they won't in the future, but I've never had any issues with them uh, with this set that I got. I've bounced them off the ground shooting the 3D course. I've bounced them off trees. Um, I have shot one through an elk, and it stuck six inches into the ground on the other side. I then shot an armadillo with it, and that's the same arrow. And it's fine, like rock solid. They spin, they spin true. Everything is, has held up great. Let's talk about 615 grains for a minute. The heavy arrow versus light arrow argument. And when I was in New Mexico elk hunting, uh, I was with a guy who is significantly more experienced than I am, Kirk Bonds. Um, I've, I, I did an interview with him kind of early on in the channel as well. You can go look at it. Dude's just a solid hunter. He's just one of those. He's just a killer. I mean, he just kills animals like he's great at it. He understands what he's doing. He focuses in, he makes the shots, he moves on to the next thing. Like, he's just one of those guys. And he was giving me so much crap for my giant heavy-ass arrows. He feels like he's heavy right now with a 410-grain arrow. So he shoots the Victory Vap 300 with the 50 uh, outsert and then a 100-grain tip. And I saw him blast through an elk, you know, in and out. He got hung up a little bit on the outside, like the like the arrow didn't all the way exit on the other side. But he also hit flesh on uh, he hit between the ribs on the near side, threw it all the all the vitals, and then out on the outside he went straight through the middle of a rib and dinked the scapula a little bit, and the elk ran forty yards, fifty yards, sixty yards, and dumped over. I mean, it was and, and he sent he sends me videos all the time of that configuration just blasting through animals. I I don't know. The the other thing that that during the testing, um, the issues that I ran into like like this this medium right here. I was hoping this was going to be like more jiggly. There we go. A little more jiggle. So I was talking to uh, the engineers, the guys at Lethal Podcast sent me like this amazing email breaking down some of my talking points from a couple of the previous videos, like the amount of time they took going into it. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Um, th thank you, first of all, because I'm just a normal dude who's trying to figure this out and, and deliver good information to people. So they've got an engineer on the team. Like these guys have been doing this a lot longer than I have. They 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 know the math of what they're talking about. If you're hearing whistling in the background, which I don't know if you are or not, that's my wife. She's trying to get the horses to uh, come up to the barn. Just FYI. 
So they sent me this, uh, they, they sent me all sorts of kinds of info. And I, I asked them about this test. While Kirk and I were in New Mexico every day, in the middle of the day, we would put a block target out and we would shoot at it. And his arrows going 310 feet per second, 308, 310, were penetrating farther than my heavy arrows going 260 feet per second. And I was like, what is happening? This is not supposed to be how this works. And then I came home and I tested in ballistics gel. So I took a 450 grain arrow versus my 615 and the 415 penetrated farther into the ballistics gel. And I was like, what is happening right now? I tried to keep them as consistent as I could with the point being the same diameter or the shaft is the same diameter. You know, maybe there's a slight, slight, slight variation, but, but basically the same configuration. And they explained to me that if I were trying to Basically, what they explained is that the issue we have is these are not great testing mediums to actually test penetration into an animal. Long story short, they, they explained to me some of the shortcomings that these have. And uh, more testing is needed for me, to be honest. I'm not 100% sold on, uh, on super heavy arrows. There were shots that in the field even though the shot opportunity that I had on the elk that I decided to take was as close to perfect as you could for a heavier arrow. Um, there were shot opportunities that I don't think I could have taken with the trajectory, even of that 615 grain arrow. So what would I do different going back into a spot and stock type scenario or, or let's even change the game up like antelope. Am I going to take a 615 grain head or a 615 grain arrow antelope hunting? No. Why? Because I don't, I don't need that much to kill that animal. And I'm assuming that I'm going to be making a 50, 60, 70, 80 yard shot. So the 615 grain arrow on an animal that can just move is, is going to create some difficulty. So for me now, are there people that have killed antelope with a 615 grain arrow or heavier? Sure. But I think to me, I would rather have something with speed on an animal that is farther away, that's jumpy, and that's also easier to kill. They're easier to, they're just easier to kill. They just are. Like white-tailed deer, it seems like are the toughest damn animals that you freaking imagine. There are three arrows in them and they're still walking around eating. They don't seem to care. It's insane. So... I am going to continue to run the day six arrows for this whitetail season because the types of places that I hunt, um, I'm not going to be taking super long shots on the deer and the arrows are set up, the bow is tuned, like everything's just perfecto. I'm, I'm super happy with how everything's running. So that's what I'm going to run. Let me look at my notes here and see there was other things I wanted to talk about. Oh, other uh, other brands of arrows that, that I like black Eagle, uh, just kind of consistently across the board. I've been pretty impressed with the black Eagle, Eagle stuff. I've got some of the 150 spine rampages just cause I wanted to just do some like nutty, super heavy arrow. Like I'll be, I'll be at a thousand grains probably when I get the, uh, when I get the head on it that I want. Again, I just like to tinker. I'm messing around. But then on the other side, the X impacts really small shaft and there I've got like a really light spine that I use for um the total archery challenge stuff two years ago and they were great like just a really really light arrow I think they were 350 grains total weight and they just straight through the air everybody else's arrows are starting to drift mine straight on target I mean money arrows so so across the board I think black eagle um has is super solid and they actually sell some components, like some of the, the uh, front end components that I'm talking about to reinforce the arrows. They've started coming out with some of those for, uh, uh, for theirs as well. So the only, the only arrow that I've shot from them that I hadn't liked is the Spartan. I love the way it flew, but to me it was pretty brittle. And like I, I remember shooting it into a fence picket uh, a couple of times. And where is my gold tip hunter XTs, which I, I think that was what that was. I could walk up to the picket and just yank it out of there. The Spartan, I'd grab it and, and it would just immediately break off where the actual shaft um, met the fence picket. Do I expect an arrow to hold up going into a fence picket straight on? Yeah, I do. 
because there are other arrows that have. So I introduced gold tip. I haven't shot as many of the newer gold tips, but that is a brand that I want to look into a little bit more again. Um, I, I really like Tim Gillingham. I like he's like no nonsense type of dude. And some of the tests that I saw where they had the uh, at the uh, ATA show where they had the uh, the arrow on a press and they were bending it and you could just watch this arrow bend, 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 bend before it finally breaks deflection of an arrow, the ability for an arrow to deflect and stay intact equals more penetration. As soon as that arrow hits something and snaps, your penetration is literally stopped. Some of the tests that I did um, with the Victory 250 spine with that massive Valkyrie head, I was shooting into a medium that uh, I'll, I'll probably show what I was doing, but basically... I uh, did day six and the Easton held up, but the victory did not. And, and not only did it not hold up, it barely broke the paper that I had back behind it when I was shooting it because it hit that medium, broke, and just completely loses all penetration. So the ability for an arrow to actually take a hard deflection and stay intact is imperative. So yeah, I want to check out the uh, the gold tips. And there are plenty of other brands that I've just n never shot because I don't... I mean, I, I go through a, a decent amount of arrows just because I'm always messing around and, and tinkering with things. But um, yeah, I think, I think Black Eagle and Gold Tip and then Victory, the Day 6, Easton Axis, and Easton in general. Easton, Easton makes, just seems to make super solid product, super solid products. It's a long video, but I wanted to do a little bit of cleanup um, just because I still feel like there's, I still feel like there's, there's going to be so there's, there is so much debate, heavy arrow that is slower, fast arrow that is lighter. And I, I want you to know that the answer for me is both. I'm going to use both. And I, I know for a fact, when I go on a pig hunt, I'm just for fun. I'm going to mess around with a giant heavy ass arrow. Like I'm going to do it because I just want to see what happens. And then I'm also going to shoot some really light stuff just to see. So, uh, yeah, that's what I got. I'm probably going to sit here and uh, drink the rest of this plantains off camera. If you guys got any questions or comments or anything like that, anything you're curious about, obviously put them in the comments below. And uh, throughout the video, I've linked the uh, the other art, the other arrow videos. You know, you, you see the top little tabby thing. Click on those whenever you see them, and that 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 will take you back to a uh, to a previous arrow bid.